We only have one hour, so we're, we're going to motor right along. Uh, I'm Paul Pickowitz, the History Department here at UCSD, and I'm going to moderate this event. Um, welcome to this public lecture hosted by the 21st Century China Center here at UC San Diego for the Global uh, the School of Global Policy and Strategy. Uh, I've been asked to just read a couple of sentences about the venue here. Uh, GPS is a top-ranked professional school in international affairs and public policy. Uh, we offer several master's degree programs to students, including one that focuses exclusively on the study of China. Uh, the 21st Century China Center is a research center based at UC San Diego at the School of Global Policy and Strategy, and we are home to a team of 20 plus active researchers who specialize in a wide array of subjects, including Chinese politics, economy, society, international relations, environment, history, on and on. Uh, so today's lecture is in a hybrid mode. So we have an audience, I think a quite like 172 people signed up online. So we have a hybrid mode. Uh, and uh, we have an audience in the room, but also on Zoom. Uh, and it is uh, a great pleasure indeed to welcome uh, Ian Johnson here today. Uh, let me just say a couple of words about uh, Ian. Uh, Ian is a Pulitzer Prize winning writer, researcher, and senior fellow for China Studies at the Council of foreign on foreign relations. Uh, so the new book, which I have in my hand, Sparks, China's Underground Historians and Their Battle for the Future. Uh, among many, many, many other things, it shows how despite the best efforts of Xi Jinping's surveillance state, a nationwide movement has coalesced to challenge the Communist Party on its most hallowed ground, its control of history. Uh, this is a great book. I've read it already. Uh, I enjoyed it uh, fully. So uh, uh, I have to read one more statement. Uh, it's called housekeeping. <laughs> Before uh, moving forward, some housekeeping rules for the audience on Zoom. Uh, so this session is being recorded. Uh, we will have some time for questions, of course, after the presentation. Uh, please, if you're on Zoom, please use the Q&A box on the bottom of your screen to submit your questions. Uh, we'll be curating the questions and consolidating them uh, for Ian to answer during the Q&A session. So uh, without further ado, the title of the talk today is called Counter Histories in China. Let us all please welcome Ian Johnson. <laughs> I'm going to show some pictures that you can look at in case you get bored with my words, um, which you won't, of course, but so let's start the slide over here, right? I'm not sure in the screen, Susan, do you need to show what you think? Ah, sure. Oh, yeah. Okay. And I can advance it just for the arrows, right? Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about this, uh, about my book, but also how I got to write it and some of the ideas behind it. And then I'll open the floor for questions. Um, when I went, I, I was in China in the 1990s and I went, uh, I left around 2001 and started to go back in 07, 2007. I couldn't get a visa right away, but eventually I did get a visa thanks to the good offices of, of various people, including the State Department. And when I got back, I was uh, I was working for the Wall Street Journal, but I, I quit pretty quickly. The newspaper consulted to Rupert Murdoch. It wasn't interesting anymore to work there. And I was a freelancer and I was writing. Of, I was accredited for The New York Times, but writing for a variety of publications, including the New York Review of Books. And the editor there at the time, Bob Silvers, See Click onto the screen first. And then you there you go. Yeah. So when I went back, I had this idea that I would write a book on religion in China, and that would be my main goal. And I, I ended up doing that. Uh, but in 2017, a book came out, The Souls of China. 
But uh, Bob uh, had this idea that, you know, you can't just talk to grassroots people. You need to find out what intellectuals are thinking in the country. And I had always been more interested in grassroots China. But um, I, I thought that, um, you know, Bob probably had a, a good idea that I should try to talk to people who were in the capital and in other big cities and, and, and ask them what was on their mind. What was the state of China? So I began then to talk to people. Uh, we had a, a Q&A series that ran in the New York Review of Books over a decade called Talking About China. You can still find it on their website. They have a dedicated page to it. Uh, those articles are all uh, paywalled, but the Asian Society, through an agreement with the NYRB, has it unpaywalled. So if you want to find those articles unpaywalled, you can look at the Asian Society has an NYRB archive. Anyway, uh, so some of the people I talked to, and the basic topic was, you know, wither China. What's what's China going through? What what are the issues on your mind? And some of the people had spiritual issues, and these are the people that I ended up writing about. And they sort of thought some of them had been through 1989, Tiananmen Square, and they thought the failure of that movement of that revolution was due to a spiritual failing, that China needed a spiritual revolution inside before it could um, address the political issues of the day. I guess that's, a, in a way, a very Confucian idea, that you first have to uh, uh, reform yourself before you can re and reform your family before you can then reform outward into society and, and the broader community. But other people had a more direct view of what the issues are facing the country. And I put some of them up here also. Uh, these are also pictures that are mostly all of them, almost all of them, in my book. Uh, and they, they thought that China was suffering from an authoritarian malaise that was primarily due to the party's control of the past, of history. And they saw this battle over history as essential to understanding and to maybe addressing in some way, in some small way, the authoritarian malaise in China at the time. This was a broad variety of people. They weren't all based in Beijing. Some of them, I, I ended up getting travel grants from the Pulitzer Center and traveling around China to different cities like Chengdu and Xi'an, Guangzhou, uh, Changsha and other places like that to try to get a broader survey of, of what thinking people in China, however you want to find that. Chinese have the term intellectuals, but it, in this country that has a negative connotation because you end up thinking of nattering nabobs of negativism or something like that. This country is sort of like anti-intellectual. It's almost like a, a curse word or something for a lot of people. Anyways, uh, to think what thinking people and educated people thought of as the main issues. And maybe I was biased because the first person I talked to was the independent historian Yang Jisheng. And so the first person in the series is actually Yang Jisheng. And so Yang Jisheng, of course, said, you know, history, and that maybe biased my whole line of question for the next decade. But he had written at that time an epic book about the Great Famine called Tombstone, which has been translated into English. He also wrote a book on the Cultural Revolution, uh, which was also translated into English called The World Turned Upside Down. Um, and there were a few other people like that. Most of these people and, and, and the works that I talk about in the book have not been translated in, into English, unfortunately. But Jan's book was, and he's probably the most famous. So maybe while I'm talking about some of the ideas, I'm just going to let these pictures scroll by on the screen. Uh, they're sort of on a timer. They're not directly related to what I'm talking about, but they're um, pictures of, of, a, of a site of a massacre in the Cultural Revolution. And this idea of memory being tied to geography, to the landscape of a place, really shaped how I wrote the book, because the book is written uh, in a large part based on, on, on geography. So it starts in the west of China, goes through the heartland of China, and then out to Chinese communities abroad. And the book also has uh, main chapters, but in between the chapters are these roughly 3,000 word interpolations that I call memories, which are initially I had this idea of it being based only on places of memory. So Liu, the memoir, places like this in Hunan. But if I broadened the idea to the concept of theaters of memory, which can include locations like a battlefield or something like that, but also 
works of counter history, like like movies or books or or just profiles of some of the people um, who didn't make it into the main part of the book. So, um, I, I, you know, as I was talking to these people, I said, memory and history really matters. And of course, many people here are American or at least living in America. And you know that in this country, memory and, and history are so important. Americans are still debating issues from like the early 17th century, the centrality of the introduction of slavery into this country. Um, we don't think anything of, of debating uh, the impact of the civil rights movement from the 1950s or more recently uh, Supreme Court decisions from the early 1970s on abortion, Roe versus Wade. So for us, this isn't considered ancient history and irrelevant. Uh, and likewise in China, these things from last century or even centuries ago are not considered to be um, something from the ancient past that has no impact on today. But I, I would argue that in China, history matters even more than in the United States. And that's, I think, maybe for two reasons. One is the party itself uses history to legitimize its rule. Um, in a way that um, most, let's say, democracies don't. Most democracies say leader X is running the country because they won an election or something like that. It's not because history uh, brought their party to power to save the country, right? So nobody sort of argues that Joe Biden is the president because history brought the Democratic Party to save the country. Although maybe some people think that. <laughs> maybe that's his argument, actually, in the, in the 2024 uh, election. But anyways, um, but it, this is the argument, essentially, of the Communist Party, that China was laid low by foreign countries in the 19th century, the Opium Wars, et cetera, et cetera. And there were well-meaning patriots who tried to get things done, but they failed until 1949, when the party took power and saved the country, made the country whole again territorially, brought the US to a standstill in the Korean War, and put the country eventually on a path to prosperity. And like a lot of national myths, there's some element of truth to that. Uh, China was made territorially whole, almost all the colonies, except for Macau and Hong Kong. Uh, sort of that, that era ended. It might have ended anyway, whether the Communist Party had taken power or not, because it was sort of the era of decolonization, et cetera. And it uh, did have, have many achievements. And eventually, after several decades, adopted policies that put the country on the road to prosperity. So the story that the, that the party tells um, is, though, essential, essential to why it justifies, why it took over in 1949. And in some ways, it echoes the way that history has been told in China in the past. When a new dynasty would take power, it would say, oh, well, we uh, take power because the last dynasty had its moments and had its heyday, but then it, it went down and we had to take over running the country because it was um, being invaded or something like that, and, or, or, or going becoming corrupt. The eunuchs were running rampant, et cetera. And so likewise, the CCP was, was saying that the, the policies in the past weren't successful and only the CCP's policies. And you know, the corollary to that, that, that sort of could explain perhaps 1949, but then people might ask, why is it still running the country, you know, 75 years later? And so it has this need to legitimize itself constantly. This idea of essentially, you know, what, what is sometimes called performance legitimacy, because we're doing such a great job running the country, and we continue to do such a great job, we have to run the country indefinitely into the future. So there's no sort of end point for the party where it's like, now we've done a good enough job, we can hand the, the baton off to somebody else. It's endless. And so that means that history always has to be curated. You can admit to a few failings in the past, but by and large, the party's historians and it's this army of people that it has working for it, making films, documentary films, et cetera, they uh, show that the party has led China from strength to strength um, and that anything else is kind of um, is, is kind of flawed and, and, and faulty. And, and it, the party does really have a lot of people doing this. This isn't just some historians writing textbooks in China. This vision of the past affects every textbook in China, every TV show that might appear on, say, the war against Japan, any 
uh, exhibition, et cetera, et cetera. So the, uh, this is a, a huge effort that the party expends. It has, I have some anecdotes and, and stories in the book about this, but even if you go to the smallest sort of county seat, there are people who are writing the local histories. Um, this affects, again, not just what is you know, in a in a in a in a textbook, but it also affects anything you get. Like you get a brochure, you go to a ch a temple or any tourist spot, the brochures that you get will will be written essentially or or heavily guided by party uh, historians who will tell how the history of that temple can be told or how the history of this scenic spot can be told. It all comes from these guidance uh, points that are issued by the party. Um, so it is crucial for for the party's legitimacy. The people who uh, who challenge this, I think, view history as likewise as equally important, and they view history almost as a, as a religion in China. I mean, I think if you there are of course religions in China, uh, Buddhism, Taoism, Catholicism, Protestantism, Islam, et cetera, et cetera. But in terms of maybe a secular religion, history plays a huge role in the psyche and in the, in the um, collective uh, view that Chinese people have of their country. The historian's task throughout the centuries in China has been almost a sacred calling. It's not just a job that somebody does. It is something that's essential to uh, many of the great stories, the myths, et cetera, of China. Um, and I would define this even sort of broadly, more broadly than just somebody who wrote uh, history. There were, you know, the first great historian of China, Sima Qian, the most well-known historian in ancient times. He was involved in uh, a court intrigue and was sort of scapegoated, was stood up for an official who was being scapegoated. He was then castrated and expected to commit suicide, but instead he continued on to write the first macro history of China because he felt it was so important and it was carried on by his family also. And when you look at the past and many of the tales, the myths, the stories of ancient China, it's very often about officials who stand up to the emperor or who stand up to corrupt officials um, you know, even like great poets like Su Dong Po get exiled because they are standing up to, to some sort of policy that they disagree with. Um, and these are the, these are the heroes of Chinese uh, myths, Chinese stories. These are, and so I think that the people I'm writing about in the book, they see themselves in the tradition, uh, in the grand tradition of people who stand up to authority and who try to tell the truth. And they often say, you know, it, the, again, the heroes are the people who stood up to the authority. They're the people who are remembered. It's not the emperor who castrated Sima Chen. It's Sima Chen who's the hero of the story. Um, so this, um, you might also say, do these, one question that, that I sometimes get asked is, do these people matter to the party? Are these just people following some quixotic, hopeless task. And that's something that's kind of hard to answer. But I do think that in the parties, in the party's view, these people matter and the control of history matter, especially I would argue for Xi Jinping. Um, I, since he took power in 2012, he has made the control of history an absolutely central policy. When he took power, his first public appearance in 2012 was in the National Museum of China. There's a permanent exhibition there called The Road to Rejuvenation, which tells this mythic story of the opium wars trying to lay low and then the Communist Party riding to the rescue and, and taking the country forward. So he shows up there with the seven member standing committee of the Politburo, which is the central group of people who essentially run the country to make a statement that this is what he's going to do. He's in that tradition of going to save China. And then the next year in 2013, he essentially outlaws criticism of the Mao era because there had been a vibrant group of people, of reformers in the party who had said, we have to look at the dark corners of the past. We have to address problems that the party, crimes or, or, or missteps that the party committed in the past. And this included 
people like Mao's personal secretary, Li Rei, and even Xi Jinping's own father, Xi Zhongshun. He was in that tradition of reformist officials. Uh, there was a, a an official, not an underground, but an official magazine published every month called China Through the Ages, or Yan Huang Chunzhou. And China Through the Ages was endorsed by Xi's own father, who, the, you know, Xi's father was not a nobody. He was one of the sort of top maybe 20, 30 officials in the PRC when the party took power in 1949, before he was deposed in a, um, a purge in 1962. Ironically enough, because of a historical novel, which uh, was about the uh, 1940s, Mao saw that as a threat to his uh, supremacy. And because Xi Jinping had given an interview and, and, and given some uh, his own uh, ideas to the novelist, he was then purged. And it wasn't like a small purge. It wasn't just Xi Jinping got purged. It was 20,000 people got purged. So these kind of things really mattered. And Xi, Jing, Xi, Xi Jinping, I think, was part of this group of officials who had come out through the Mao era and said, we can't allow this to happen again. We can't allow a leader to have so much power. We have to have some institutions. We have to be able to address the problems in our party. And so he endorsed this magazine, China Through the Ages. And the way senior officials do that is they write a piece of calligraphy and um, they and, and he did that. So he wrote a piece of calligraphy saying, uh, China Through the Ages is doing a good job. Or something like that. Yan Huang Chun Zhou Ban De Bu which is kind of I don't know. It seems like a seems like a half hearted endorsement to me. <laughs> like Wen Hao was like Bu Zhuo, but anyway, well, maybe Bu Zhuo. I don't. Know. Uh, but it, so he gave this piece of calligraphy, and they would you know print it on the back of the of the magazine, almost like a talisman. Look, <laughs> Xi Jinping supports us. It's on the back of the magazine, along with some calligraphy by Li Rei and some other people like that. It was on their website and so on and so forth. But in the act of Oedipal defiance, uh, Xi Jinping closes the magazine in 2016. So his father was, of course, dead by by then. But uh, and the reason I think is probably not edible defiance. It was probably because he and he's he's actually spoken openly about this that he sees the fall, the collapse of the Soviet Union as a great tragedy, as a huge crisis. And the reason for the fall of the Soviet Union was primarily ideological. That. Gorbachev allowed Glasnost openness, mm -hmm. and he allowed groups like the NGO Memorial to investigate the party's missteps, the, the crimes of the Stalin era, and he sees this as, as, as absolutely crucial. I mean, it's interesting that a generation earlier, right when the Soviet Union collapsed, that generation of officials like Deng Xiaoping and the people around him drew a different conclusion, and they thought that fall of the Soviet Union was due mainly to economics. And so after that, this is also in the wake of Tiananmen, China was in a, a mini deep freeze for a couple of years, but Deng Xiaoping then gets economic reforms rolling again with his trip around the Southern China to endorse reforms. He puts reformist leaders in place like Jiang Zemin and Zhu Rongji, and he gives the green light to economic reforms. So he sees economics as the key problem, the, the, the lack of consumer goods, the lack of prosperity is why the Soviet Union lacked popular support. But for Xi Jinping, well, I don't think he totally rejects that. He sees ideology as center. And he has this one speech, which you can actually find on YouTube, where he says, at the end of the day, nobody was enough of a man to sort of, in the Soviet Union, to sort of crush these ne'er-do-wells and keep the Soviet Union going. And the the implication is he's that kind of a man who's going to do that. Um, and he won't allow these counter historians with their mumbo jumbo about the Mao era and these unfair criticisms of the party to dominate popular discourse. So bit by bit, they come under more and more pressure. However, some of them still work and do do uh, interesting work. I show a few profiles of people here um, kind of briefly. Uh, there are people from, I would say, all walks of life were involved in this. When I say historians, I am, there are some people who have a PhD in history and who work in, as historians. They usually don't write history about the Mao era or the, 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 the Communist Party's history, but they are trained historians and they write academic articles with the full academic apparatus of footnotes and, and, and so on and so forth. But many of them are autodidactic. And, and for some reason in their life, something hit them and they realized 
that they had to, this was their calling in life, and this is what they would do. And this is one person, Tan Ho Chung, who in the 1980s was sent down to southern, he, he's from Hunan province, he was sent to the south of Hunan, to Dao County, Dao Xian. And those pictures that I showed before of that, the, the site of the massacres, um, that's all uh, taken with, with him, because I went down there with him. Um, and he was sent down there in the 1980s with an investigation team, because this was really the era when the party was like, we have to investigate how could the party officials themselves massacre 9,000 people in this county. It was an incredible massacre. It wasn't things got out of control or something like that. It was ordered by the party. So the reformist leader at that era sent 1,200 people down there to do a real thorough investigation. He was one of them. He was with state media. They got back to, to Beijing, and they were, he got back to Changsha, and the winds had kind of changed. He was no longer able to publish the article, but he felt it was his duty to do this because he'd made a promise to the people that this should never happen again in China. And the only way it could never happen again is if he published something. So he made it his life's work. Every summer, he'd go back to Dow County on his own time. And in 2016, wrote um, a really long book um, about that. That has also been translated into English, one of the few books. It's called The Killing Wind. Um, here we are doing some of the work, some of the people. This is another person who figures prominently in my book, the independent journalist Zhang Xue. Uh, she worked for state media and then quit in 2013 as the party was essentially purging reformists in the state media and anybody who's writing critical articles. And she went on to write um, a series of, of, of important articles about human rights, lawyers, mm -hmm. and other uh, things like that throughout the 2010s. Um, let's go back to that in a minute. Uh, the other person, I think there's probably two main characters in my book. One is that, the journalist Zhang Xue, and one is the independent filmmaker, feminist scholar, Ai Xiaoming. Uh, she got involved in this, you know, for a, a variety of reasons, but she came back from the United States. She spent one year at the University of the South in Tennessee, and she brought back with her the uh, a copy of the, the, the manuscript for the vagina model. And she translated it into, into Chinese and she had her students perform it. And she, she thought, this is really a great thing. Somebody should make a documentary film of that. So she called up her old buddy, Hu Jie, um, who is probably China's leading independent documentary filmmaker, or at least one of them in my mind. And he came down with his video camera and, and started to make a documentary. And then she thought, you know, I can do this too. Um, any idiot can make a film, right? Um, <laughs> and so she began to mentor with him. And so she, they made about four or five films together in the late 2000s, early 2010s. And she's now made um, about a dozen films. So they started out small, um, like 45 minute films about topical issues in Southern China. She was living in Guangzhou at the time. And again, people like her are autodidactic in the sense that they never went to film school. They didn't train. And but she's a very ambitious person. And so she's, and, and, and Hu Jie and other people like that, they really looked at the great documentary films around the world, especially films about the Holocaust, directors like Klaus Landsman, Marcelo Fils, films like, films like Hotel Terminus or Shoah, and gone through you know, scene by scene and kind of dissected how, why did the director do it this way? Why did they do it that way? Why is the camera set, set up like that? And uh, they, her last film that she made is a very ambitious four and a half hour film on the most notorious labor camp in, in China, Jia Bian Go. Um, and so this is you know, how a lot of the people work. Another thing that's worth noting, let me just skip over that, is the role of technology. Um, this, there have been throughout the history of the PRC, uh, just like in any country, there have been people who challenged the state's view of the past. There were people in the 50s, 60s, 70s who uh, tried to challenge the state, who wrote alternative versions of what was going on, who, who wrote critiques of, of the Communist Party's one party rule. But mostly their works vanished. And one telling example is this magazine called Spark, from which I get the title of my book. It was written by students who had been exiled to Western China in 1960 
in the city of Tianhui, they saw the famine firsthand, and they decided the only way to address this was to start a journal, a, a, a magazine. And so they got a hold of a mimeograph machine, and they hand wrote the the text. And they each issue of the of the journal had eight pages, so it wasn't huge. As you can see, it was pretty pretty basic. It didn't have color graphics or anything like that. But they uh, published this, uh, collated it, and sent it off to party branches around the country. This is the only thing they, they thought we could somehow alert people to what was going on. The articles are really interesting and very topical for today. They concern things that are still, that still matter in China today. Like there are articles in here on the lack of freedom of expression, on the way that the one party state can throw up a leader that has excessive power, like Mao, or perhaps today you might think to a lesser degree, Xi Jinping. Um, also little things that are actually quite crucial that the fact that the state owns all land in China, every square inch of land is, is owned by the state. Farmers don't own their land. And this is why they had to fo follow the crazy economic policies of Mao. They didn't have the right to plant what they wanted to do. They didn't have the right to own this. And so they wrote articles about this. Now, as you can imagine, in the 1960s, this was quickly cracked down on. Uh, the party came and arrested them. 40 people were arrested. Three were executed. The magazine would have probably just vanished. Uh, one of the many efforts by people but to, 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 to sort of challenge the party, but that disappeared. All the issues were, were rounded up and so on and so forth. But in the 1980s, one of the students, um, let me just get a picture of her up you know. here. Oh, okay, here, the, the person on the left, Tan Chan Shui, she was able to look into something called her personnel file, which is something that exists for many Chinese people. And it includes, it can include banal things like your high school test scores or something like that, but it would also include your police record. And so she found in there all the self, all the confessions, all the police documents, 500 pages of stuff, including all the issues of Spark. So she had access to this. And one magical morning, she was un, she was left unattended with her file and she took photos of everything, all 500 pages. She took it back to her home in Shanghai and it basically just sat around in her apartment until the late nineties. And this is where I would date the beginning of the modern kind of counter history movement in China. The advent of basic digital technologies, two. One is the PDF, which allows you to recreate these magazines, right? If you put these photos together into a PDF, voila, you have Spark again, and you can start emailing it to people. And this is what happened in the late 1990s. It had an electrifying effect on many independent thinkers in China. The uh, writer and, and critic Sui Wei Ping said, now we have our genealogy. Like now we know that there were people 30 years earlier struggling with the same things we're struggling with today. So PDFs allow you to recreate banned books. It allows you to recreate lost journals like this, but it also allows you to self-publish. And this is the beginning of this huge movement of independent history writing in Zamazdat style journals. Um, so, you know, Zamazdat in the, in, in the Soviet Union was done by typing through uh, carbon paper, you know, triple click, quadruple click, you'd hammer the key really hard so it could go through, mm -hmm. and then you'd hand it off to somebody else and they'd type it. But of course, this is a more sophisticated way because you can just email it to people. Um, it also inspired people like Hu Jie to make um, some of his first great documentary films, including one on Spark and on the Great Famine. The other technology that is important is seen in this picture, the basic digital camera. This allowed anybody and allows anybody to make films. So, you know, you don't need sophisticated equipment. And especially now, we all know our iPhones have cameras in them that can do 4K or whatever and et cetera, et cetera. But starting in the late 1990s, something like this was affordable. You could edit the film on your laptop. You didn't need to go through any state authority. You didn't have to go to a movie studio. You didn't have to go to a, a TV studio or anything like that. You could just do it on your own. And this was a flowering of a huge number. I've counted more than 175 uh, independent documentary films that address these uh, issues. And so Hu Jie is just one of the people, like I say, Ai Xiaoming, many other people like that as well. Um, 
yeah, there's Ai Xiaoming with her camera. The other funny thing about this is this grainy picture is really good in a way because one of the hallmarks of these films and maybe the books also is the low tech, the rigorously low tech, grungy look to it. <laughs> Like these are people who are saying, you know, the party spends a gazillion dollars every year on the latest equipment, bringing in the latest high tech cameras, sending their videographers abroad for training, hiring people to run workshops so that they can make slick, glitzy propaganda films, et cetera, like, et cetera. We don't do that. We make films that are grainy. Sometimes I'm like, can you buy a can you buy a, a tripod because it's like awfully shaky it's like no no we want it to be shaky because that shows it's us making it and not this party um and so this is kind of one of the aesthetics of, of these films um let me you know yeah i said one final thing i think before before stopping um this isn't just about events from last century like the great leap forward or the cultural revolution or even Tiananmen square this goes up to the present there are people doing things on the Shanghai lockdown or on the white paper protests and things like that. So it's something that because the party's need to control history is never ending, the challenge to it is also in a way never ending. You have younger people who are involved with these kind of topics. And I think that's a, a really kind of interesting trend. Um, just say the one final thing. Yeah. Yeah, I want to just mention, I people often want to know, where can I find this stuff? Uh, you can find it, uh, we can find it in many places, but I set up a charitable organization in the U.S., a 501c3, called the China Unofficial Archives, and it is a collection point for the Samizdat publications, books, films, etc. The books and, and, and magazines can be downloaded. It's a fully bilingual site. It's aimed mainly at Chinese people, but it is bilingual because English is sort of the international language of scholarship. So I wanted to make it uh, accessible to other people. Also, if you go into look at the collection, you can um, you can sort the 800 items that we have by era. So say you're interested in the Cultural Revolution or format, like I want movies on the Cultural Revolution, you can click movies, you can click Cultural Revolution, and it'll you do the movies that we have, themes, and the creator. So if you're like, oh, I'm interested in Ai Xiaoming, you can click Ai Xiaoming, and it'll give you everything we have on Ai Xiaoming. Um, if you look on this uh, book, for example, you would get that with a description about what the book is about, what its significance is. And it, it's also, as I said, in Chinese as well. And then below this, which you can't see on the screenshot, is the book that you can download as a PDF. So with that, I'll stop and open the floor for questions. Thank you. There it is. Uh, so I have a million questions, but uh, I'm only going to ask a couple because I'm really interested in the questions that you have in the audience. And we want to leave as much time for that as possible. Is that okay? Uh, with us. Okay. Yeah. So, um, let me just ask a couple of questions and then thank you for the talk. That was really interesting. Uh, should we sit? Will it be on the camera? It will. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's fine. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So uh, my first question is, and I, and I got this from reading the book, which I love, uh, but it also comes out in your slides as well. And the question is, what accounts for the impressive activism of women in this school? Uh, because page after page, and in your presentation, lots of women appear. And I want to ask you, what accounts for that? I mean, I shall mean, uh, she's 70 now. So uh, AAP, Lin Zhao, on and on and on. You mentioned many, many more names. So. Uh, it's impressive. It's really impressive, the activism, but any reflections on that? Yeah, that's a, uh, it's hard for me to know. I, I think I, I thought a lot about that, and I've asked, actually, Zhang Xue, the, the, the journalist I mentioned, she was going to write an article or a, a book or something on that. I, I, I'm not sure. So we've, we've exchanged ideas, and I wondered about that. If I look today um, at the landscape of... Uh, Dissent, for lack of a better word. I kind of avoid the word dissent because I don't want everybody to think this is all just people who are in and out of jail or something like that. Most of the people I write about have one foot inside the system. They're university professors or whatnot. But if I look at the scale, say critical thinking, even today, 
you know, a lot of the a lot of the men are, you know, there are men doing great work like Huja and so on and so forth, but a lot of them get involved in these kind of internecine battles and especially abroad, you know, these dissident uh, groups are often battling over some internal political issue while women seem to be actually doing something. I'm not sure. Is <laughs> that just like the male ego that always has to, you know, I'm number one of this thing or I'm doing, I'm not really sure. Um, but this is a bit of a cliche, but uh, the exact reason. But I do think it is uh, not, notable. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's... Uh, it wasn't, I didn't set out, out. I didn't set out that the two main characters would be women. But then all of a sudden it was just, <laughs> it was like that. And, and there, were, there were so many people who did that. But I... Um, okay. Uh, what, let me just ask one minute kind of question. I'm just going to ask one more because I really want to know what's going on out there. And that is uh, your account goes up to happily about 2019, 2020. So we get COVID. It's the very end of the book. You link what happened during COVID to this long history. Um, but that's already about five years ago. Uh, but, you know, the book comes up to about, but since then, four or five years have passed. And, and my question is, uh, what's happening more recently? Because those of us have gotten to go back to China and uh, listening to people, uh, it's, it's discouraging in many ways. Uh, one wonders, is this momentum, is it somehow continuing? Uh, some of the activists you talked about are getting older now. Uh, so the, my question is, are there successors, as far as you know? I know that's not in the book. That's not what the book is about, but you're very well informed. Are there successors to all the people who are uh, written up so well in your book? Um, and as you answer that question, I think it's going to reveal to us how hopeful you are. I mean, are you, are you hopeful still, or are you also beginning to feel What's going on? You know, is is has this come come to a halt? So, well, I, I think there's no doubt that it was uh, much easier to do this kind of work in the 2000s. Yes. Um, so after that, there's probably the heyday was the late 90s when all this digital technology began to take hold for the next 10, 15 years, and that was sort of a heyday when a lot of it was easier to do this kind of work. Um, uh, the book ends. Yeah, the book ends with the COVID. Thing. And I have Joan Stray writing her an essay at the beginning of 2023 where she talks about, but she, and, and the essay though is quite interesting because she talks about the young people uh, in the white paper protests. And she, it's, it's one of her best essays. Uh, it's called Who Are the Young People Today? And she's quoting Havel. Uh, she's r riffing off Havel, who wrote this essay in 89 called Who Are the Young People? And so he's, uh, who are standing up. At, you know, when, when the Iron Curtain would fall, and he said they were supposedly all the people who were brainwashed, uh, who grew up in Czechoslovakia, who had experienced nothing else, and yet for some reason they stood up, and they were the ones who were pushing in 1989. Yeah. And I think you see the same thing happening in China today. It's true, and I think it's true probably for all of us that you get often motivated or excited by something that you personally experience. Yeah. So the, the guy I mentioned at the very beginning, Yang Jisheng, he wrote the book Tombstone about the Great Famine about his stepfather in honor of his stepfather who died in the famine. And other people, like the guy who's the founding editor of Remembrance, uh, the magazine uh, Remembrance, he experienced the Cultural Revolution firsthand and went to Inner Mongolia and saw all the massacres that had happened there of ethnic Mongolians, and that inspired him to get involved. And that inspired many people, many of that generation, but being sent down youth and, and seeing the reality of China outside the big cities. Um, and but I think it's the same for uh, young people today. I, I would think, I would argue that for anybody under 40, this is probably the first sustained sense of I don't want to say crisis, but maybe big question marks that they would experience. They wouldn't have experienced Tiananmen. And they probably would only have experienced the 90s, the 2000s, the beginning of the 2010s, when tomorrow was a better day for most people. And yeah, there were major hiccups, like the crackdown on Falun Gong, when a thousand people were sent to labor camps, and so on and so forth. But overall, for the vast majority of people, 
Um, you might not agree with what the party was doing. You might even find it repugnant. But because your situation was getting better, it was easy to buy into this thing. Of, I'll just keep my head down and my kid can go to college and we can afford an apartment and we are getting our passports and the first time in our life we can afford a, a trip overseas, you know, middle, middle, real middle class people, not people we often describe as middle class in China, we're actually upper class, but like real middle class people can afford a package trip to, to Europe or something like that. It was like mind blowing for, for many people. I think that has ended, right? And that era of fast growth is over and now we're in this period of slow growth, it's not even clear how fast the growth yeah. is, uh, high youth unemployment, the kind of debacle of the second half of the COVID lockdown. So you could say the first half of the COVID crisis was handled okay by the yeah. party. But afterwards, when the rest of the world is moving on to mRNA vaccines and lifting up, China went through this year plus of lockdowns. I think for many people that was yeah. a bit shocking. And then also for people who are a little more politically uh, savvy Xi Jinping taking a third term. I mean, it had been telegraphed already in 2018. But when he actually did that, I think for a lot of people, it was a bit shocking. It's like, God, he's never going to really lead. It's really happened. Usually it was 10 years, so, and then a leader would retire. I mean, not an ancient tradition, but there had been that for a couple of, of terms. And so I think for some people, this is a, a period of uh, questioning and, and maybe even crisis. And that's why I think there's a lot of young people getting involved with stuff. And there's a lot of interaction between people abroad, especially in this country or in Japan, in Tokyo, in Europe, Chinese people and people back in, in China. And so I would say maybe I am a little bit off. He's so cool. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I love the stuff in your book about the, the, the excitement about the technology, new technologies in the 80s, 90s, and after 2000. But now we're seeing the state sure. grabbing onto that technology and using it to its advantage. But anyway, let's not go there. So keep your questions as short as possible so we can hear as many voices way up in the back. Nice and loud, please. Thank you. Um, so we know this is similar to what you were just talking about. I still mean through her translations and teachings has influenced a lot of the younger feminist and LGBT movement in China. To what extent is that true for other historians? How does their work interact or influence other social movements within China? That's a good question. Um, I think she had a, a very important role because many of, she was, like I said, not only people are, classic distance. She was a university professor who published works in, in China, right? So it had a broader audience. Um, I don't think that's true for people like Hu Jie. Um, I think that probably didn't have such an impact. I think Zhang Shui's writings were quite influential in the human rights movement. She wrote a piece on the families of human rights lawyers that went kind of viral in China. Um, but I think I tell me is a pretty special and important person in that regard. Yes, Jeff, this gentleman. Yes, is your book going to be published in China in Chinese? <laughs> I have um, a contract with the people. I, I would have it. But, <laughs> um, what about all the students from China that are studying in the United States that can read your book, go to your website, and then go back home? Uh, it's going to take my own book. Back. <laughs> uh, no, the book will be translated. It's supposed to come out in June in Taiwan. Yep. So it's been trend. It's being trans translation basically finished. It took a lot of work because I wanted to find all the original transcripts, and I, you know, because I took took the words and transcribed it, uh, translated into English. I didn't want the translator to translate that stuff back <laughs> into Chinese. So I had to like find the original words of I Chao Ming and Zhang Chao Ming. And uh, so it'll be translated in Taiwan, and then you know, through the good old. Uh, PDF, it will make its way back. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, so I feel this is a book which about China, but it's also a book about humanity. Right? Yes. I imagine like in many, in most of society, all of the societies, when you have such repression, there will be people who do similar work. So since you have been thinking so much about this, I'm curious, like, in which aspects do you feel this is, you know, there's something special about China? It could be from the CCP side or from this intellectual side. You know, women, this could be one of them, but are there, you know, are these people, well, yeah, they just are just curious about, you know, compared with, you, you, you mentioned how we are, you mentioned uh, Soviet Union, you know, there could be there many, uh, you know, in Chile, there's such a group of people. So what, you know, what do you think? Uh, 
Well, um, yeah, and I, it's part of the authoritarian playbook to um, instrumentalize traditions and the past. So Putin does that also in Russia. Right? He makes himself the defender of the Orthodox Church and I'm restoring Russia, making Russia great again, and so on and so forth. So that is sort of part of the past. I think in, you know, it's hard for me to know because I'm not a Russian studies expert or something like that. So to make a real comparison, I do think though in China, it resonates very strongly, the past. And I think it really motivates these people. I mean, the people I, I talk about, I remember one of the guys, uh, uh, this guy, Tiger Temple, I asked him, why do you do this? Why do you do, do this? He said, yeah, I, I don't, I'm not on for great education. I don't really, I can't answer all these theoretical questions you're asking, but I, one thing that ticks me off, I have this sense of E, uh, righteousness, right? Justice. Like I have to stand up when I see something. And you know, they, they are really inspired by the people in the past. So there's kind of like no higher calling in China than the historian who's telling the truth. And I think that really in, influences people. Great questions. Way up in the back. Nice and loud, please. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was wondering what your process was for profiling all these other historians, like how long it took in like, um, in like, I guess, just your general interview process. And also, are these people like facing repercussions for speaking out or like recounting this his history? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that was a great question. Well, I started... I started working on it in about 2012 while I was working on the religion book. So I was working on the two together. The religion book had more of my time at that point, um, but I began to do more and more as I finished the religion book in 2015, 2016, and just focus on that. Uh, most of the work inside China, the field work and, and following people around stuff was ended around 2020 when I was expelled from China. So I went back to China last year to touch base with people but the well the work is mainly by going and interviewing people um and talking to them in person and that kind of thing the repercussions the people i talked to uh, all wanted to be interviewed and i went over this many times with them about whether they were comfortable with it but people like Ai Xiaoming, uh, Hu Jie, uh, Tan Hu Chang, these are pretty savvy people so they're not you know, as I, when I was a journalist, I would find that many, you know, many of these farmers or something in the countryside, you go and interview them, and they're very, they have a lot of bravado, you know, and they would say, yes, you can use my name, they take out their shen chen zheng, their ID card, and say, take a photo of this, and put it in the paper, and tell them what La Wang thinks in this village, and you know, <laughs> maybe not, um, <laughs> media coaching with you, uh, but these other people know, and they think it helps. I mean, actually, one of the things at the end of the book and the conclusion is I have a plea, in a way, to civil society in the West to do more to support these people, to have film festivals, where there's maybe a film festival for these, uh, even if they can't come out to the film festival, even if they're barred from leaving. It's a big wind in their back if they know that somebody else cares, because I think it's a, it's a lonely job that a lot of the people have, and to know that somebody cares overseas um, you know, I'm in touch with Aisha Ming regularly. She's thrilled about it. She helped with the translation and stuff like that. Yes, ma'am. I'm curious about what is being said about Jack Ma 10 years ago, 20 years ago, today, and 10 years from now. Oh, well, I, I'm not a great person to ask on Jack Ma, but I mean, obviously, he's somebody who's uh, who was seen as a as a model worker, if you will, or a model entrepreneur, and now is, I don't know if he's completely disappeared from the public sphere, but he doesn't have much of a public profile in China anymore. I think he's an example of one of these entrepreneurs who's been brought to heel. I think if Xi Jinping maybe takes a lesson also from Russia, it would be that they don't want these kind of big entrepreneurs, these wealthy people to start spouting off on public issues. And I think maybe that's where Jack Ma crossed the line. Um, he had these sort of hobby ideas about Taoism, but then he said other things also criticized interest rates and so on. And I think that's why Xi Jinping cut him down. So I think they're skeptical of these kind of, of anybody who's outside the party who could be seen as a threat. We've got about five more minutes. I'm gonna hear a few more voices. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, uh, the, uh, about two or three years ago, up at Roosevelt Hall on campus here, uh, they uh, had a, a forum. Uh, they had a group of uh, reporters from CNN, and they uh, were talking about 
Tiananmen mm -hmm. Square. And they had, he, he was a reporter at the time, and he was reporting there, and he had films and showed it. And there were a bunch of uh, Chinese students there, and one of them raised their hand, raised his hand, and said, We never heard of that. That's how true. They, yeah. How yeah. they whitewashed yeah. Yeah. the entire, and you know, the, the university students, they're not dummies. You know, they're smart people are coming here. You know, so they really, they hoodwinked. Uh, the the whole um, the, the the main generation afterwards. Yeah, I I, I mean, I, maybe two quick points. So one is I think that probably in any society, a, a lot of people don't know very much about the past. Like if you probably ask uh, most young Americans who won the Vietnam War, they probably say America won the Vietnam War, or something like that. So they probably wouldn't be too clear about what happened uh, there. But uh, that's not an excuse. But uh, clearly, it's a different, a completely different level of, of, of whitewashing. And, and you're you're right to point that out. But what I find is probably in in any society when you're when you're faced with a crisis. It is kind of like you're in the Matrix, you know, that movie The Matrix, and you see this warp in the Matrix, and you realize that reality is not the way you thought it was. And as long as things are going good, you're not going to really look too much, too hard. And so for a lot of people, there was no upside really to looking too much at those kind of sensitive and unpleasant issues from the past. But when you're now faced with, say, a slowing economy, you're having a hard time finding a job, maybe you begin to think, well, you know, the party's explanation of reality doesn't work. And you begin to look at other things. And that's why I noticed during the COVID lockdowns, I, I sort of skimmed over these pictures, but there were some uh, crucial writers from the Cultural Revolution whose essays were then were recirculating in the lockdown among many people's feeds, um, essayists and, uh, and, and so on. And they weren't commented on. They just shed, sent those essays out there because they obviously had parallels to the, to the present day. And so it was clear people were beginning to draw on this. But I think it's only maybe if you're forced to, because, in, you know, in any society, change also only comes from small groups of people. And it's probably only gets a wider following when people feel a need for it. And so if China were to go back to double-digit economic growth or something like that and everything, and the party relaxed a little bit and had a less hard-line policy and, and laid off a little bit of society, probably there wouldn't be that much demand for this. But I think that's unlikely, and I think there will be more demand in the future. Let's take two or three in a row, and then we'll give you one last say. So let's go with Lei first. Okay. A technical question about archive, what maybe historians can help answer this as well. What constitutes an archival item for you in this particular case? Because the last item I saw was a published book, for example. Yeah. So my question is, I mean, I can't just look at the title without thinking about the phrase, a single spark stars a prairie fire. But I want to douse a little bit of pessimism here because for every single China's underground historian you group in a profile, there are five or more of them are betting on the state side. So it's not it's not a matter of these underground historians versus the state. It's the underground historians betting, I mean, battling with other more numerous um, the historians. So in that sense, you know, it, it what used to be relatively easy for the sparks to spread because the state may be, uh, be blocked by information and would not know there are spaces possible for these intellectuals. Right now, the entire internet is, you could be singled out by all these rich lanterns on the net, yeah. right? And you and the state were just kept right at you. Yeah. So how do you, I mean, how do you, I mean, the optimism I want to see, but I'm just very pessimistic. Okay, okay, a couple more, sir. Uh, it would be fair to say that the Chinese Communist Party will use force to put down anything that they think would cause change in their rule of China. Good thoughts. Okay, one more. Yes, last one. <clears throat> I heard that a lot of Chinese people are trying to leave China now, and some of them are even trying to be to move into the U.S. illegally, like just like uh, immigrants from the Latin America. Yeah. Can you provide some perspective on that? 
Okay, last word is you. Okay, so um, archive. It's called the China Archival Archive, but it's, uh, I define that very loosely. It's not an archive in the sense that we have documents. In fact, we don't have documents. We have magazines, books, and films. Um, there are great websites that have doc a lot of documents and stuff like that. Uh, that would be too complex for us. So it's meant to be a resource center for all this other stuff. Uh, the optimism, pessimism, maybe those are almost like a similar question. I think the internet, I, I specifically don't think of the internet as useful for these people. They don't think of the internet as useful. They don't use WeChat or, or Weibo, which is kind of like Twitter or something like that in China. So they, uh, because that is too easily controlled. Mm -hmm. So they use much more, much simpler digital technologies. Uh, they use, you know, USB memory sticks or just give, see, here's my film. Here's a copy of it and stuff like that. So that's the kind of thing they do. Uh, it is harder now. And I think some of the people view this as, as messages in a bottle to future generations, uh, that there were people keeping the spark alive now, even though it's impossible to get anything done in China, and especially to get eyewitnesses on the record, people who saw these various things, be it a massacre or even COVID lockdowns, just to try to get that. So I think that that's their role now. I think they are in a kind of a bit of a bunker mentality now. For sure. Yeah, yeah, I think they, well, the party will use violence. I think Tiananmen Square showed that. Um, but I think in terms of these people, they probably feel that by denying them the oxygen of social media or any media presence, they limit their influence with ordinary people. And therefore, they don't need to sort of, you know, arrest them all or like that. And yeah, I mean, in terms of, I, I don't know exactly, I do read these reports about people who are coming up to the Darien Gap and and walking up to the United States and crossing over near here, not <laughs> what I've heard in the media. Uh, but whether and exactly what that reflects is hard for me to know. I mean, it's obviously not on the same scale as the crises in, in, in Latin America, where you obviously have existential issues for people. But I think it's because that path already exists. And there's also some hypotheses that social media in China sometimes well, the government hasn't blocked everything about this. So there are like these um, doyen reports about how easy it is to do that. I just fly there and you can walk up to the United States. And it's absolutely, of course, wrong. It's a brutal, hard trek. And I think a lot of the people who've been interviewed when they arrived here say they didn't realize that. Now, I, I don't know. I haven't done research. That's maybe one of the reasons. Okay, I've been asked to say, uh, before we thank Ian, that the next public lecture here will be on April 2nd uh, by Samantha uh, Vorhams. And it's called Manipulating Authoritarian Citizenship, Security Development, and Local Membership in China. So uh, let's thank Ian Johnson.